and we actually work closely with them. And we are partnering with them as well in training, in training their members as well. Thank you. Which country are you from? India. India. Uh, okay. The next uh, question would be from Omani from Egypt. Please take it. Um, good morning, I'm Omnia, I'm a medical student uh, from Egypt. Um, so I, I, we had the, uh, the Nigerian Minister of Health and then our Global, Global Climate and Health Summit. So I wanted to ask you about uh, any further plans that you have in terms of collaborating, the collaboration between the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Health to integrate more of health co-benefits into the indices and will Nigeria be willing to uh, lead by example in terms of multidisciplinary collaboration between these two sectors and pushing for ambitious NDCs and their implementation. Okay, thank you. We actually have a brown and interministerial committee made up of the Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Agriculture, and Ministry of Water Resources. So we're all actually working together for one goal. Then we have another question of the ACE Working Group. We read that you already implement several elements of, on ACE in adaptation and mitigation of your NDC. However, since it has been studied that all of the elements of ACE can help the implementation and the acceleration of NDC, you think you should add all of the six elements of ACE and have it as a section of the future NDC. So this one, this is one, uh, one of the uh, action on, uh, on climate empowerment elements. So, what's your vision uh, on implementing the climate education in the school curriculum, uh, and uh, what do you think is the best approach on promoting uh, the public awareness? Yeah, the public awareness. For climate education, we're working closely with the Ministry of Education to make sure we include it in the school uh, curriculum. And as I had said earlier, the agencies that are tasked with the protection of the environment in Nigeria always organize sensitization workshops, educating people. And we have a lot of uh, climate strikers in Nigeria who are doing this. They have uh, Wednesday's uh, climate event yeah. on Twitter that we do in Nigeria. Climate Wednesday. Climate Wednesday, yes. We have the Climate Wednesdays. And they have such a large followership on, on Twitter that I'm going to urge most other ministries to join with them. It shouldn't just be the young uh, strikers that are taking part in that. Yes. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Is there anyone from the Women and Gender Group? You can ask your question. Can you come Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, should we ask any question? Yes, ask. Okay. My name is Kulegani Mapaza. I'm from South Africa. Um, thank you very much, Minister, for 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 joining us and for talking to us. Uh, my question is about the climate change legislation in the continent of Africa, especially legislation. Yes. yes, in July I was invited in the Pan African Parliament Committee on Environment 
uh, to do a presentation about how do we um, envision the, the, the future of, of um, um, integrating the, the, the climate policy, the international climate policies into our, into our legislations. And one of the studies that I read was the a study from I, 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 I don't I cannot recall uh, from uh, um, for, for now the institution. But then I found out that in, in, in Africa there is only one country that, that, that appears to be uh, the least the least country that, that has um, that has scores in uh, when it comes to having a climate change legislation that is that is well um, that, that is well established and then there was no country there was that Nigeria was not part of the of the study and I think that that country was Namibia so my question to you is, is just about that what is the, the status quo of developing the climate change legislation in Nigeria. We already have the climate change bill that is waiting for the assent of the president. But it was actually returned. It's gone through the first reading at the National Assembly. In fact, this question you're asking me, the first engagement I had with the youth, that was the first thing they asked. So I'm assuring you today, Nigeria will lead the advocacy to make sure that every country in Africa passes the legislation. So hopefully by uh, first quarter of 2020, you should have the news of the legislation in my jury. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. And you have a question from this? Um, good morning, everyone. Your Excellency, good morning. Yes, I represent the Women and Gender Constituency. I'm from Women Environmental Program, uh, Nigeria. Uh, I, I, will it be okay to ask all the questions from the Women and Gender Constituency? And oh, definitely. And my question. <laughs> okay, so from the Women and Gender Constituency, uh, the first question goes, uh, we understand that Nigeria may not have the capacity to uh, self-fund its indices. So what is the government doing was looking for strategies to funding the NDCs. And then the second question from the Women and Gender Constituency. The World Economic Forum reveals that 40 million people depend on the lake chart that has 90% that has vanished. The Northeast Nigeria has been greatly impacted by the Boko Haram insurgency that will be linked to migration from neighboring Lake Chad region, caused from depleting scarce resources as a result of climate change. Has Nigeria engaged indigenous people and women groups to implement nature-based solutions like sustainable farming techniques and adaptation interventions? If not, what are the plans? And then the last question is from uh, Web. In Nigeria's NDCs, um, agriculture is one of the sectors that the government aims to reduce emissions from. And currently, the government still shares chemical fertilizer to farmers through its anchor borrowers program and other uh, agricultural programs in the country, which is contrary to the NDCs and the Paris Agreement. So, as the ministry that is the designated focal point, point for the UNF Trade uh, what do you think uh, you can do to get uh, agricultural programs to be more organic than sharing chemical fertilizer with source of greenhouse gas emission? The first question was on how we're going to fund our NDCs. Am I correct? We all know that most uh, developing countries cannot really fund their NDCs, so they're looking for international uh, partnership. And besides looking for international partnership, we're looking inwards as well and looking at the private sector and partnering with the private sector for the funding of our NDCs. Then your question on uh, 
Lakeshad uh, region. Yes, that is a very, very sad one. And as I've always said, climate crisis is female. It's the women that bear the brunt of it. I am a strong advocate for women as well. Besides incorporating the youth into, into what we do in the Ministry of Environment, we are also involving the women to a, a greater extent than we are with the youth. We're working our policies on how to recharge the lake charge. We know that most of the security crisis we're having in Nigeria today is the herdsmen looking for water for their cattle. So we're looking for alternative uh, means of uh, sorting out the herder crisis, the um, herdsmen crisis that we have in Nigeria. We're having cattle settlements to have the cattle in one place, then migrating and moving to, to look for water in other states and bringing prices with the farmers. Then for the women as well, we have this clean cookstove initiative that was started in Nigeria. And we're going to go further with that to find alternative uh, energy for the women to use. Then the issue of fertilizers and looking for the organic way. Africa has their own, uh, how would I put it? What would go for the developed world? Why not go for Africa? So whatever solutions we're coming with, it should not be based on developed world standards. It should be based on our own standards. Definitely we have a goal to transit from non-organic to organic, but it will take us time. If we do it immediately, our people would go hungry. We have a food crisis. So we should be able to do it in our own way at our own time for our people in Africa. I hope that answered you a bit. Because I believe in every policy and everything we do, there should be compassion. And we have to be compassionate with those in the developed world. And again, we're not actually the major culprits for the green gas emissions, are we? Uh, okay, you, you introduce your name and uh, what your question. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, the Honorable Minister of State, for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Eluji Lopez from Nigeria, and I represent Youth for Nature. Uh, now, the discussion is about the inclusion of youth and nature itself and in combating the climate crisis. We are aware that it's not possible to achieve the one point five without youth and without nature. And to youth inclusion, uh, the discussion is beyond getting them aware about climate change. It's about meaningful engagement of youth in climate action. So uh, youth are talking, we are talking about transiting from just the education to meaningful engagement. And considering the level of poverty in Nigeria and motivating some more sustainable practice in youth, like um, getting engaged in uh, being, uh, exploring their uh, the poverty level now to engage them in some illegal activities like logging and the likes, and also uh, degradation of the environment. Uh, we are talking about empowering Nigerian youth to be able to really take up um, climate action that not only uh, motivates their, their inclusion, but also fetches their money uh, so what's the plan of the Nigerian government to really build the capacity of youth uh, towards green jobs? Uh, one could be capacity building, organic fertilizer production, and many more like that. And then as far the nature, nature aspect of it, which we know without nature we can actually 1.5 as well. Uh, considering the high level of forest degradation in Nigeria, uh, to my knowledge, I'm very much aware that about 90% of our forest estates is degrading, it's degraded now and still getting increased at an alarming rate. What are the mayors put in place by the Nigerian government to cope the high rate of deforestation in Nigeria and also mobilize efforts 
to our forest degraded, to the forest degraded lands and also cover up the exposed ones. Thank you. Okay, you talked about um, the youth and how to, sorry? Capacity building for youth as regards to Capacity job. building, yes. It's not only capacity building, it's financing the youth. Because I have realized that the youth have the innovative solutions to most of the crisis we are facing today. So we must find a way to finance the ideas of the youth. One way we are doing that in the ministry, we have had a national, regional uh, innovative hub for Nigerian youth. Once we go back from uh, COP25, we're going to have the national innovation hub where youths from the six regions of Nigeria come together with their solutions. Government will now find funding to finance their solutions. That's one way we're going to do it. And um, as touching the nature aspect of it concerning the forest degradation in Nigeria, because we know we have lots of forest resources. Yes, we're, we're drawing up a tree planting strategy. We realize we have that uh, uh, problem in Nigeria. And we're engaging the youth and the women in the communities to go on for that tree planting. We have the Green Green Wall Initiative, which is taking off in Nigeria. Ethiopia has been at the forefront and I'm hoping that Nigeria will catch up with Ethiopia. Thank you, Ma. And lastly, just one point. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that communities around forest reserves in Nigeria, yes. uh, it's a common practice for them to depend on the forest resources for their means of livelihood. And telling them to not depend on these resources because we want to conserve it will be taken away their means of livelihood. So what's uh, the plan? No, we're government? definitely not take, going to take away their means of livelihood without giving them something in return. Even for the tree planting, they must be given something to be able to plant the trees and nurture the trees as well. There is a, there's a program that we also want to initiate. This is for the recycling site. You bring in, uh, say, two kilograms of plastic and you get two kilograms of rice in return. So for the tree planting, we're thinking of cash crop trees as well, that the communities can plant and derive uh, some economic benefit from those trees. for being here and I would like to say uh, thank you again for the first time that we're having Nigerian youths as part of the official delegation. That's something we've been uh, fighting for globally with all the countries and it's good to see that Nigeria has implemented that for the first time in our history. So thank you for doing that and we can only ask for more in that regards that also that when they come next that they should be able to be more in number but also to be able to stay for the, for the full two weeks. And also, that, uh, of course, there's a lot of things to do at the national level. And it's good that you're engaging with us already because we had a meeting with you before coming to, uh, to Madrid. And so we also like to continue that engagement to see how we can work uh, collaboratively to support the efforts of, of the government. Hitato, we don't like to engage the government because the doors are closed. And um, it's really frustrating. But uh, if the doors are this open and very genuine, then we will be able to come close to engage. And thank you all for having me. And like I say, I'm not a senior citizen, I'm a recycled teenager. <laughs> <laughs> and I urge every country to engage their youth because once the youth do not trust government, hatred and all other forms of social uh, crisis will set in. They say your destiny is in your hands. I'm glad to see that the world, the global youth, are taking their destiny in their hands. The future belongs to you. So who better to be on the table with us to talk about the future but you? Thank you very much for having me. Uh, 
another question. Uh, let me give the floor to Oman. Um, so the, uh, this just a, uh, an invitation, not a question. So there are the World Health Organization air pollution pods, and I'm inviting you to come and visit them. They are right outside the cold venue, and they are played by an artist where it, uh, it consists of different rooms, and each room has the air that it simulates the air in different cities all over the world. So for example, from Beijing to New Delhi to Copenhagen, and it shows the, the impact of breathing polluted air. So I invite you to come and visit anytime you are free. Okay, thank you. I'll definitely visit because air pollution, who suffers it the most? The children. I will be there. Thank you. One last question to the audience, if there is. Uh, okay, I'll take uh, two questions, then we'll close the session. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for being here. My name is Cheva Kamalba. I'm a Nigerian Canadian, and I'm representing the African Marine Environment Association Initiative. Uh, my question is around how the most effective ways that you found to enable behavioral change, because that's one of the major factors affecting uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation as well, is how do we change attitudes? Because you also mentioned the clean cook stoves, for example, and we know that sometimes developed country standards are not what we want to impose on people per se, but when we have things like clean cook stove, for example, how do we allow, how do we teach people in an effective way to, ad to adapt to those things and to use those things because we have that technology and it's good for our environment. So, I'm just curious as to how your ministry has been able to effectively um, change attitudes to positive environment. What we have done is we started using the clay, uh, the clay food stoves ourselves. From our immediate communities, they will see us using those clay food stoves. And they will ask, how does this work? And they say it. Right now, there's a program that's run in the southeast of Nigeria. And it's a group of young uh, people. They're teaching the women how to make the uh, briquettes as well. And we are taking that idea as well from the youth. And we're going to expand it. Then he had talked about faith-based uh, groups. They are so key in giving out information. Once we get them involved, they're usually part of every program we do. And they now get the information out for us. Uh, okay, I'll give two last questions. Uh, I'll take it uh, at once, then Her Excellency will reply. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. My name is Elizabeth Gilgulu. I'm from Zimbabwe, representing African Youth. Yeah, African Youth. Uh, my question is, have you realized the impacts of climate change on agriculture, how it is affecting food security, not only in Nigeria but also in Africa? Uh, how best uh, can you support young people that are trying to implement climate smart agriculture? Because we have realized that climate smart agriculture needs a lot of technical support and a lot of financial support in trying to install irrigation systems, etc. and also I wanted to ask, do you have plans of um, program exchange with the youths from Nigeria and youths from Zimbabwe so that uh, we can take it as a learning process on the mitigation and adaptation part of on climate change efforts? Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Richard Kumbakaruma. I'm from Youth Voyage of Nigeria based in Mina Niger State. My, I have some concerns here, uh, Mr. 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 My concern is what can the Ministry of Environment do in attracting? I want to applaud you for your green bonds and your commitment so far. But the issue of attracting direct investment into carbon credits in, in Nigeria to be precise, in, to Africa. It's, the technologies are very expensive. I was in, in Ghana, uh, uh, Africa Climate Week. We saw the Nigeria technology in uh, Rwanda, Australia. The technologies they are introducing for the carbon cut, carbon reductions, 
are expensive. They are not. There are things that will take time to adapt to. We need to, do, uh, for, to for us to investigate them. Will take a lot of time. But what I'm thinking is, why can't you attract direct carbon investment? Since we know the carbon credits brings in money, I want to know if you thoughts are towards that direction, so that because Africa we, have, we lack resources, we have a lot of issues before us, and the resources are very meager. So I'm thinking of bringing in carbon investments so that if we can cut down this, if we can meet our indices or even exceed our indices, so that whatever process that comes on top, we do plus or minus, the investors take their own share, and we have enough money for development. Yes. So I want to know if our thoughts as a country, as a continent, in that direction. Thank you. As an individual and as a country, we have thought towards that. I've always advocated that developed countries, I would rather they give us the equipment and the technology than giving us aid. So we can do things ourselves. The expenses for us to be able to meet our indices, we in Africa, we can't do that alone. So I'd rather they give us the equipment and empower our people with the capacity than giving us uh, uh, aid. Then also, Africa must come together. There is uh, the Africa Ministerial Council uh, that is there. We must have further conversations on financing. It's key to everything we do. Then going back to the young lady in uh, Zimbabwe, exchange programs will be very good. Because what happens in Zimbabwe is probably happening in Nigeria as well. Victoria Falls, how full is it? What's happening to Victoria Falls? It's probably what's happening to Lake Chad. So we will definitely look into those uh, exchange programs. It will help. Uh, <clears throat> okay, before, uh, before closing the session, I would like to uh, thank you on behalf of uh, Young Group, I use constituency related with UNF uh, I know you have a very busy schedule uh, today. Uh, this week is a very high level segment. So uh, from your busy schedule, uh, on behalf of Young Group, we would like to thank you. And also we would like to witness that uh, Nigerian users are uh, doing an impact at the global level. With this, uh, we can uh, see uh, uh, this year, focal point because Ude is leading the uh, the Yongo as a focal point from Africa. So uh, please uh, let's uh, give up word for Ude as well for taking this leadership on behalf of Nigeria and also Africa. And uh, really, really thank you. Uh, and let's have a good photo together here.
ですよ。